glad that we have managed to make this a hybrid rather than a just virtual thing because in my own view uh, personal interaction is always uh, educationally much more uh, uh, you know bear some bears better fruit and in my personal view because i've had some personal experiences regarding marriages of my children and for the first time because of covid it was very limited and i found that this was one of the most enjoyable experiences that i had so i hope that this hybrid meeting with the interaction i think i can see around 30 to 40 people in the hall plus and this is the first session and i'm sure that it will be uh, interactive and very challenging i've been told that because they are queuing up people so i have to speak a few extra words but i think that the most important thing is that uh, we do need to stick to time because I think mostly in Pakistan, uh, the meetings are spoiled by the fact that we go over time and everyone gets um, disturbed because of that. So I think that I would reassure re, uh, everyone that uh, they will be given time slots and I'm, I would just request all my uh, esteemed colleagues. Lastly, but uh, not least, I think the international uh, support that we've had through personal contacts and through uh, their own efforts, the international expat community of Pakistan, I think they have a lot to contribute. And this is where um, I think the future lies that like uh, our neighbors, uh, their faculty, expat faculty, which is based in US and other Western countries have really supported their, uh, their, uh, their own uh, local lives and i think i'm sure that uh, uh, now we have gone on to that path where there will be extra support with that i thank you very much and i hope you have a very uh, pleasant fruitful and education meeting and thank you once again um, uh, everyone for coming in time and i hope that this uh, remains throughout the meeting thank you very much okay thank you uh, professor andim uh, I would like to request uh, uh, Dr. Noman Nasi to uh, come and moderate the session, please. Thank you, Dr. Mushri and Isa. This is a very much needed session for Pakistan life because it is a very underutilized um, uh, intravascular uh, physiology and imaging is very underutilized in Pakistan. And I would like to invite the panelists onto the stage, uh, Professor Nadeem Hayat Malik Saab, if he's here, please. And uh, Dr. Asim Jawed, Dr. Kushid Hassan Saib, I believe Dr. Wahaj Aman is joining us from US, and uh, Professor Khalda Sumro, Dr. Abdus Samad Saib, and uh, Professor Nazir Maiman, Professor Amber Ashraf. And I believe uh, Professor Shabazz Qureshi is already online. He's joining us uh, from Islamabad. Our first talk will be on utility of intravascular imaging and optimizing PCI. <laughs> what should we use, OCT, IVOS, or both with case examples? And it's going to be given by Dr. Ziad Ali. He is a... Uh, uh, Professor Shabazz, Director at DMATIS Cardiovascular uh, Institute, St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center, and also Director of the Angiographic Core Lab at Cardiovascular Research Foundation. So look forward to hearing from you. Uh, are we ready there? Uh, Professor Shabazz, uh, is already online. He's joining us. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, we are ready to go. Thank you. Okay, so, so I can proceed? Yours. Yes, you can proceed. Thanks. Well, um, Assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to join you all. I wanted to say thank you to Bashir for inviting me. And uh, as mentioned, I'll be talking to you about the utility of intravascular imaging and optimizing PCI, OCT, IVUS, or both. Uh, I am the director of the Cardiovascular Institute at St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center and the director of the Angiographic Core Lab at Cardiovascular Research Foundation. So the first thing I'd like to start off is some of the fundamental differences between IVUS versus OCT, understanding that there are considerable financial um, determinants of its use in uh, countries like Pakistan. Uh, there has been uh, iteration in IVUS technology and OCT technology over the last several years that really wasn't uh, built upon over the last 30 years. IVUS was first used approximately 30 years ago and uh, 
probably 15 years ago was the 40 to 45 megahertz IVUS catheters. But now we're into the high definition phase of 50 to 60 megahertz IVUS and OCT. And what's important is you'll see that they have very high axial resolution. IVUS has a better penetration depth. And one of the major issues with OCT is that you need to clear the lumen of blood because OCT is a red light and anything that's red that gets in the way will obscure its image. But IVUS has a strong backscatter, so it's a little bit more difficult to do image interpretation. Now, if you want to know the clinical difference between IVUS versus OCT, you can take a quick perusal on the left side here, and you can see that overall the number of boxes are similar between the two. And there are certain advantages to IVUS. It's got an extensive clinical experience. It's got a better penetration depth. There's lots of clinical evidence. There's established predictors of TVF. And then there are certain situations where it's going to be advantageous because OCT is a hazard, such in CTO. OCT has a higher resolution. It's easier to interpret images. The tissue characterization is better. And there's automatic measurements, which are the major advantages of OCT. <clears throat> What I'd like to point out is in terms of clinical outcome, the only randomized controlled trial for clinical outcomes comparing IVUS versus OCT showed no difference at one year. This is the opinion trial, which randomized 800 patients in a non-inferiority design, and you can see that IVUS and OCT were non-inferior at one year. <clears throat> now what's important to note is that for the first time in 30 years, we finally have a consensus document, although it's not a guideline, on how to use intravascular imaging. And the fundamental take homes from this fast track clinical research that was first published in 2018 is that IVUS guided PCI improves clinical outcomes, that IVUS and OCT guided PCI are equally effective in imaging endpoints, and that IVUS and OCT are likely to provide similar clinical benefits. If you look over here on the right side, this is the author's opinion, i.e. mine, of what I think the differences are between IBIS and OCT. To summarize these, I would say OCT is a superior modality for imaging guidance because it allows you to do the simple steps of PCI guidance, like a TAVR, better than IBIS. However, for specific clinical situations, such as chronic total occlusions, left main coronary artery, osteolesion, and advanced CKD, IVUS is superior. Severe calcification, OCT is superior because it has the ability to measure the depth of calcium as well as its arc and length. What I'm not going to do is bore you with tons of evidence. What I'm going to do is summarize quickly evidence in a nutshell. And essentially what I can show you is that IVUS versus angiography in this meta-analysis of only randomized control trials of over 5,000 patients with greater than a year's follow-up, IVUS reduces cardiac mortality, reduces myocardial infarction, reduces target lesion revascularization, and reduces stent thrombosis. So essentially every clinical endpoint of impact to our patients is reduced by the use of intravascular imaging compared to angiography. It's also important to notice that in a network meta-analysis, which encompasses basically all of the studies that we have to date, in this study, 31 studies encompassing almost 18,000 patients, compared with angiography, PCI guidance using either IVUS or OCT was associated with a significant reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events and cardiovascular death. So this is not simply a tool that reduces target vessel revascularization, but it also reduces death. Now you might say, well, you know, you, you, if you can use it, you probably get some bang for your buck in the simple lesions, but actually the data supports that in the most complex lesions, you have even a better hazard ratio for a reduction in endpoint events. In this meta-analysis of 3,000 patients, you'll see that there's a significant reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events with almost a 36% reduction using IVUS guidance compared to angiography. So when should you use it? You should use it always if you can afford it. And so the question becomes in Pakistan, where it's a little bit more difficult to use this on a day-to-day -day basis, while it's, it, it can be difficult even in the United States, how do you make that distinction? 
when do you really need to use it and when can you use it? I think this is the best way to summarize. If you take all the patients in your practice and do imaging guided PCI on every single case, including this simple type A lesion in the right coronary artery, your number needed to treat is one in 116. It's difficult to justify in Pakistan, for example, that you would be um, able to justify the cost of 116 IVUS catheters or OCT catheters versus one benefit. But when you look at the number needed to treat in the complex patients, this patient with a long, diffusely diseased left anterior descending, <laughs> along with a subtotal diagonal, you'll see now the number needed to treat is 37. So this number needed to treat is less than ACE inhibitors for heart failure. It's less than beta blockers in heart failure. It's less than diuretics for hypertension. There are very few drugs which actually have a number needed to treat less than 27. And this is a single one-off use cost. You're not dividing it like you are a pill every week or every month. It's a one-off use cost. Which patient should you use it for? Well, you, we know from previous studies in this 13,000 patient study that I did with Greg Stone, that the highest hazard of events happens in patients with diabetes, acute coronary syndromes, long stents, bifurcation lesions, severe calcification, chronic total occlusions, instant restenosis, and CKD or end-stage renal disease. So when you have these patient populations, more so when you have a synergy of these patients, right? So when you have diabetic patient with an end statement with a lesion longer than 28 millimeters, this is really the area where you're gonna get the maximum benefit for intravascular imaging. What I'm gonna focus on in the last 10 minutes or so is how to use this. And what we've done is focus to make intravascular imaging easy for everyone by getting rid of all the hocus pocus, all of the looking at macrophages and trying to look at vessel expansion and negative and positive remodeling. And we've simple to, simplified it into this MLD max algorithm, which looks at morphology, length and diameter pre-PCI and post-PCI medial dissection, apposition and expansion. And the reason that we do this is that there's evidence for all of these steps <clears throat> for improvements in clinical outcomes. So here's a patient with a subtotally occluded left anterior descending, kind of a typical lesion for any of us. We know that IVUS or OCT, when to use what, and so what we're gonna do is something unique here, and we're actually gonna do IVUS and OCT in the same patient at the same time to demonstrate to you what the utility is of each of these devices and the advantages and disadvantages. So let's look at morphology. If you remember the right corner, this is a human right coronary artery, the innermost layer is the intima, the outer layer is the media, and the outermost layer is the adventitia. IVIS and OCT, now with high definition, have similar resolution. You can see all the layers of the artery walls with great ease. And while I'm not gonna go into this um, right now because for the sake of time, if you use an algorithmic approach for image interpretation, it's actually very easy to learn IVUS and OCT. So here's our pre-PCI of our subtotal LAD. And as we scroll through the artery, we were able to see the three layers of the artery wall. You'll see some blood speckle inside the artery. And as we come into the lesion, there's a side branch you can see coming at approximately six o'clock. That's an intramural hematoma, so there's blood trapped in the intima at six o'clock. Another side branch coming in, deeply attenuated plaque, so this is heavy lipid, and now we're going into the middle of the lesion. So wherever you see that deep attenuation or loss of signal, that is going to be deep necrotic core. Fibrous plaque, here, another side branch, and so what I'm, the reason I'm telling you all of this is because as we scroll through, what we've noticed is there's very little calcification, and that provides us utility in determining what our predilation strategy is. Now, if we quickly run through our pre-PCI morphology, we have fibrous tissue. Two minutes to go. We have a hematoma, and we have a hypoechoic chronic thrombus. So I, I, I don't think I can finish in two minutes because we started about five minutes late. So if you want me to I'll give you two minutes extra, <laughs> well, I, I can cut early if you want, but it's going to be impossible for me to do this if I started five minutes late. Um, so if you want to, um, if you can see the OCT image interpretation uses the same algorithm by using an approach algorithmically, we can do image interpretation more quickly. 
If we do pre-PCI morphology by OCT, what you can see is we have an advantage of being able to do angiographic co-registration. And what that does is it allows you to look at the artery from the inside out as well as the outside in. And so here, what you're going to see is us quickly perusing the artery. And what you'll notice here is that the resolution of the OCT is considerably better. And what that allows you to do is see things and make decisions more easily and effectively. And so here's the pre-PCI morphology by OCT. And really what we're looking for is heavy calcification. So next, when we do length, what we're going to do is I'm going to skip through this and show you how to do length in real time. So what we're going to do is scroll into the artery until we see the lesion and find an area of the artery where there's no plaque. Do the same thing in the proximal vessel. So roll into the plaque and then roll out of it and find a relatively normal segment of artery. And then again, make our measurement where we get the normal artery. So this defeats the downside of the angiogram, which is you don't really know whether or not your normal tissue. Gary Mintz showed almost uh, 15, 25 years ago that at 50% of the time, there's a major plaque burden in the reference segments. If we do the same thing by OCT, it really is much of the same process. Here you can see we scroll into the lesion, then we scroll out of the lesion until we see the normal reference segment. And this is the place at which we can make our measurements. Here you can see all three layers of the artery in a normal segment. We're gonna do the same thing proximally to find a normal segment of artery or the most normal we possibly can. We do our bookmark. And then what we're going to do is taper in because there's no 37.2 millimeter stent into finding a, a better length. So for diameter, what we always typically do is we measure the external elastic lamina if possible, because that gives us a bigger stent area. And that's an example of us measuring the EL. You can see that's 3.46. I'm going to skip ahead to the OCT and show you the same thing. Here you can see again, the OCT which is the same with the extra time. And here you can see the reference segment is three millimeters. And so you can see that the pre PCI OCT strategy, as well as the IVA strategy are exactly the same. So this is pre dilation and then post PCI when you, what you want to look for is to look for medial dissections. And the way you look for a medial dissection is find the edge of the stent and quickly see whether or not there's a flap. So you can see on either side whether or not you're able to see a stent or a dissection. So you mark the edges. Now the advantage of the OCT is that it automatically detects the stent edge for you. And so you can do edge detection much more easily. So you can see there's no dissections. For apposition, really for IVUS, this is a manual pullback to see whether or not you can see any abnormalities. But by OCT, it's much easier because OCT automatically detects malapposition, here identified in red. So there's very little malapposition. And finally, expansion by IVUS requires you to manually peruse the artery. And this is one of the downsides of IVUS. So you measure the distal reference and then find the minimal stent area along the length. But by OCT, it automatically detects for you the expansion, which shows you here the expansion is only is, is 92% unless you're fully expanded. So um, as a result, this is your final result by both IVUS and OCT. I think it's a unique example of how you can uh, you, you get to the same result using both IVUS or OCT. You've assessed the morphology, the length and diameter, and then you've made sure that there's no complications with medial dissection, apposition or expansion. So angiogram clearly has limitations. The benefits of intravascular imaging of PCI outcomes are irrefutable. It's better to use it than not use it. It's not that hard, but it is hard to present it when they don't give you enough time and cut your time off at the beginning. Thanks. Thank you very much. It was an excellent talk uh, with very nice case examples. And hopefully with the data that you present with the number needed to treat of 37, more people will be convinced to use IVUS uh, more frequently. Uh, it is really underutilized uh, because of cost issues uh, in Pakistan.
Our next talk is on assessment of intermediate coronary lesions uh, by FFR, IFR, and CT FFR by Dr. Rajiv Johar, who is uh, Chief of Cardiology at North Shore University Hospital and also Vice Chairman of Sandra Atlas Pass Heart Hospital. Um, we look forward to your talk. Um, can we have Dr. Rajiv on? Can, can you hear me? Can you see my slides? Uh, just hold on. Uh, you're not on, uh, on display over here. Can you share the screen? I did. Anya. Yeah, you're good to go. I'm good to go, and you can hear me properly, yeah. right? Hmm. Perfect. Hey, listen, it's, it, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to uh, speak at the Society today. You know, Bashir and I have been friends for 21 years. He was my, one of my fellows in when he was in New York in the late 1990s, and he's, uh, he's really gone on to a terrific career. I'm so proud of him, and I'm also proud of what you all are doing with this conference. I mean, I've seen the agenda, and it, it's, a, it's a tour de force of uh, speakers as well as uh, a terrific uh, session. And if it wasn't for the fact that it's midnight in New York, I'd be up all night listening to every one of the speakers. It's, uh, it sounds like a terrific, terrific- Thank uh, you for doing this. Uh, it was our pleasure, my pleasure. Uh, it's always hard to follow Ziad Ali. I've been, unfortunately, my whole life, I've been following him in, uh, on talks, and it's always, always difficult. Even with that red shirt on, it's a, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, so I was given the task of talking about physiology. You know, when I was a fellow in the 1990s, all we had was luminology. We, did had, uh, we had uh, angiography, and we sort of looked at a lesion, and we said it's 70%, and then we fixed it. If it was 80%, we'd fix it. If it was 60%, we probably would not fix it. And there was really a, a, a hit and miss in terms of understanding <clears throat> whether a lesion was physiologically significant or not, because we were unable to interpret the data. Uh, we had IVIS eventually, but uh, physiology, except for stress testing, was not available to us. And, and for the non-acute lesions, uh, for the intermediate lesions, you know, if you have a 95% lesion in, in an LAD, it's clearly easy to understand how to treat that lesion. And, using imaging and IVIS and OCT as Ziad mentioned is, is very, very important. What do you do in the 40s to 70% lesion where you don't know what to do? And you don't wanna uh, put a stand in something that's not necessary. You don't wanna bypass the lesion that is not physiologically, physiologically significant because the, the graphs will close. And so I do have no, I have no disclosures. So, how do, I, how do we define moderate lesions? Well, a stenosis more than 40 to 70%. Now that's really difficult to assess angiographically because we're looking at luminology and there's a classic inter intra observer variability. I mean, when, we, when I call my colleagues and say, you know, what do you think about this lesion? I'll get a variation from about 20% in terms of stenosis, uh, uh, the criticalness of the, st of the stenosis. And so that, change in, in, in percentage. And we, are, we, we treat coronary artery disease in a very binary way. And that's probably not the right way to do it. I mean, understanding the physiology and using the techniques available to us to do physiology like FFR, IFR is so, so important. Um, and again, I'm only talking about stable lesions, unstable, vulnerable plaque lesions, uh, ACS, uh, non-STEMI, uh, the, the, uh, the, the physiology is, is essentially thrown out the window just for that lesion alone. So in, in a typical, in an atypical patient with this lesion, whose left coronary artery is, is essentially non-significant, has minor EKG changes, is a former smoke, smoker, but has atypical seat symptoms, how to treat this lesion? You know, if I, if I pulled the audience here, I would hear anything from 40, 30, 40%, up to 70%, I'm sure, 70, 80% by, for some of my colleagues out there in, in Pakistan. So that variability is, is unclear. And how do we treat this patient? You know, what is the best, best option to treat this patient? Well, our best management in treating patients with any degree of coronary stenosis is to prove that the patient has true ischemia in that same territory. Physiology trumps anatomical data all the time. You know, the era of let's just fix it because it's 
it'll, it'll get worse or the era of we are here already, let's just get, get it fixed is passe. That doesn't happen, nor should it ever have happened. The notion of tacking up intermediate lesions has never been shown to be of any benefit whatsoever. So that has no value. We need to have systematic, quantifiable, reproducible data that allows us to assess lesions uh, uh, on, on, on all the arteries. Is FFR needed in, in, in all lesions? Well, clearly in, in the 50 to 70% stenoses, there's a 35% variability between what is FFR positive and what people thought was angiographically significant. And as you get tighter and tighter, there's less variability. But you know, in, in Tonino's paper in 2010, he showed about a 25% mismatch between FFR and, and severity of stenosis by visual estimation. And we know that looking at intermediate lesions in, in, in several centers around the world with an FFR of, of less than 0.8 is seen in people who essentially had uh, uh, lesions uh, who, which were intermediate in nature, uh, 40 to 70%, or what we call the optimal cutoff of about 2.5, 2.9 millimeters squared. So the reality is that even in patients where we thought there were significant, what we thought, thought were significant lesions, the FFR was, was positive uh, by, by criteria in only 31 to 32% of the patients. And that is highlighted by the COURAGE trial. You know, this was one of, what was probably the bane of our existence early in my career, uh, when it, it, it essentially showed the medical therapy versus PCI was equivalent with people with patients with one, two or three vessel <coughs> disease using optimal medical therapy versus PCI. However, if you look at the ischemia and the COURAGE trial, true ischemia was only noted in 31% of these patients. No or limited ischemia was in 69% of the patients. So the reality is that we did not assess ischemia properly in the COURAGE trial, which we did in FAME2, which, was, which showed that 100% of these randomized patients had extensive myocardial ischemia. And when you compare the, the randomized trial in FAME2 with uh, when they had an FFR less than 0.8 and were randomized to PCI and medical therapy versus just medical therapy, we saw that when you had a physiologically significant lesion, PCI versus medical therapy had a significant reduction in event points. PCI versus the registry, which was just medical therapy, did not show any significance in, in, in difference in event rates because the patient did not have significant lesion. And in medical therapy versus the registry, there was a significant uh, difference in, in, in therapeutic intervention. So if you treat a patient medically who has this positive FFR versus a patient who has a negative FFR, there was a difference in, in event rates. So what this shows is that patients who have a significant FFR uh, did better with PCI uh, than, and, and patients who had a, a negative FFR did better, better with medical therapy. And in terms of urgent revascularization in significant FFR patients, the patients who got the PCI did significantly better uh, on, the, on the average of about 14 to 15% better with a significant p-value. And so the gold standard early in my career was FFR. You give adenosine, you create a hyperemic state, you assess uh, the distal over the proximal, and you get a percentage, and, and less than 0.8 was, was became the standard uh, to assess for significant physiologic disease. The patients had problems with FFR because of the, the, in, the infusion of adenosine and, and symptoms from adenosine. IFR, which has been developed over the last several years, which is called instantaneous wave-free ratio, looks at instant pressure gradients in diastole during the wave-free period when resistance is constant and minimized. It's a quick cost-effective way. Today, I did 10 cases of which four of them I, I used IFR on. And I can tell you that I was convinced that all four would be negative and, and three were positive. Uh, requiring uh, stenting. Comparing IFR to FFR, well, defined flares, sweetheart, all both showed that there was really 
IFR was equivalent to FFR in, 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 uh, in, in its use. In the right situation, IFR was equivalent to FFR in its use without having to expose the patient to adenosine infusion, which, <coughs> all, which does cause symptoms in these patients. So in that patient we, I, I showed you earlier with that mid-right lesion, the IFR was positive at 0.86 and the patient got a stent the, I, I don't have the post, I didn't show the post IFR, but it was a 0.94 and it was, it was negative. In this patient, the IFR was negative and we stopped the case, treated the patient medically and the patient has been doing very well for about a year now since the procedure. <clears throat> what do you do in this tricky scenario where you have a 68 year old gentleman who's hypercholesterolemic, has a CTA, which shows significant right coronary disease, but no functional analysis. His left coronary arteries have some mild mid LED D D disease, but really nothing that is uh, what appears to be significant in nature. His right coronary artery has a probably a 70, 80% lesion. Some would argue just to stent it. There's no physiologic data to prove it. So we did an IFR on this patient and it came out to be 0.9. And this is where the hybrid approach may have some value. The operator in this situation was not comfortable with just the IFR. And if you look at the hybrid model, when you have a situation with the IFR in a basal resting state from 0.86 to 0.93, getting a, a, an additional FFR with adenosine may be beneficial you reduce the need for FFR in about 60% of cases, but it does provide you a second uh, option to assess these patients. Some people would just fix this and, and say, you know, the IFR is 0.9, I'll fix it. But that is against uh, true, true binary criteria. So the IFR was 0.9, FFR done on this patient showed a FFR 0.68. The pullback showed the largest gradient in the mid right coronary artery was treated with one stent. And then the repeat IFR was 0.93, but the repeat FFR was still 0.78. And that probably uh, defined by the distal right lesion, which is now it appears to be more prevalent uh, on the angiogram. So the distal right was then treated with a, with a DES stent and the FFR remained still positive. Uh, so the operator then decided uh, with the pullback proximal in the PDA, the FFR was negative, the FFR was negative. So he decided to stent the right PDA. And now the FFR was 0.83, still connoting some, some diffuse disease, but uh, we, we, he stopped at this time and, and, and uh, the patient has been doing very, very well since. Now in 2021, we've been very fortunate to use CTFFR. You know, instead of having just the anatomic data, we now also get physiologic data with the CTFFR. A and the data suggests that the CTFFR has good correlation with our tried and tested FFR, IFR models. And it, even in our, own institution, in our own institution, we've seen that. Uh, it reduces the need for invasive angiography in these patients, does not reduce costs. And I'm not sure if it's available in, in, in Pakistan right now, but uh, we've started using it more frequently. And in, in this example of this LED lesion, the lesion was significant in just in the LED, but there was no significant lesions in the circumflex or the right coronary artery. IFR, uh, also showed a significant uh, mid-right positive uh, at 0.84, and the patient underwent a stent and the IFR was then now 0.93. Two minutes so, to go. I'll be done in two minutes, I promise. So what percent of cases should get physiologic lesion assessment? I personally believe that 100% of the time in lesions that need it. If you have a 90% lesion, I would probably not, I would not do IFR, FFR on it. If you have a 90% proximality lesion, I would not do it. If you have a, what you suspect is unstable plaque or vulnerable plaque, I would not do IFR, FFR on. But with lesions with unknown significance, I would do it 100% of the time. 
And that's evolved in my training because I was not a believer four or five years ago. Our next speaker, Pervez Miraj, my colleague, will attest to the fact that I was not a believer. But now I'm pro I'm, I am the highest user of IFR, FFR in our institution. And we do about 3,000 PCIs a year. So what are the conclusions? Well, the right decision to do physiologic testing in the setting of stable moderate coronary artery disease is really to assess ischemia, whether you use non-invasive functional testing, CTFFR, or intracoronary hemodynamic testing. Use physiology, not anatomy, in intermediate lesions. Use OCT IVUS in patients when you suspect plaque rupture, intracoronary thrombus, ACS. But there's clearly strong evidence that FFR is improving clinical outcomes and saves cost. I thank you for the time. I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And I hope to be in Pakistan in the next year or two years, whenever it is live again. We look thank forward you. to having you over here. Uh, that was an excellent talk. Hopefully we can imply the computation to it, the dynamics that you showed with CTFFR in future in the cath lab as well, and have a wireless FFR concept for these intermediate lesions because the cost issues with these wires. But again, for all intermediate lesions, uh, important to remember using the FFR. Now we'll go to the next talk uh, by Dr. Pervez Miraj on imaging and physiology, how to put it all together for precision PCI. He's director of the cardiac cath lab and director of the CHIP CTU program at Northwell Health. So thank you, Dr. Baran. I guess we are taking a one minute break and uh, we can utilize that one minute for some uh, opinion thoughts from the speakers. Uh, if you're <coughs> I guess my, we can have a question from the audience if, uh, well, if not, then I can ask Dr. Ziad Ali to, uh, you know, any thoughts on the um, stent uh, optimization? What is the best stent optimization expansion criteria that you use if the stent is fully expanded in a non-left main artery of 5.5 millimeter square plus area? You know, what I've been using is if it's 90% of the uh, average of proximal and distal luminaria, the various criteria, and recently on the ADAPT ES uh, uh, substudy of the IWIS, there was a, uh, you know, a criteria used, which was uh, minimal stent area versus the stent area at the stented segment. Um, that was the best predictor of clinical outcomes. So which one do you prefer in the lab in terms of stent optimization um, criteria? Can you hear me? Yeah, so thanks for your question. Um, the simple answer is it doesn't matter what um, metric or target you use, whether it's greater than 90% of the distal reference, the mean of the distal and proximal reference. The reason is you almost never completely achieve it. The mean number in the clinical trials, the mean number of patients in which optimal expansion achieved is 50%. The translation of that is, is that whenever you set yourself a target, whether it's 80% or 90%, that it reminds you to vigorously post dilate to make the stent as big as possible. And that's the whole game. It, obviously, if you post dilate with a balloon size to the external elastic lamina and the stent is still under expanded, you shouldn't keep going because you'll just cause more and more myocardial necrosis. In that situation, the key is to try and get the stent as big as possible, but which metric you use doesn't really matter. Ziad, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Ziad Bashir here. Uh, thank you very much. An excellent talk. And I really want to apologize for interrupting you again and again, but we wanted to stay on time. I know we were a little bit delayed because of technical issues. Now, my question is that... Uh, what percentage of patients in your lab you use um, IVUS, OCT um, routinely or only when you need it? Uh, roughly what percentage you use it? Um, basically in every single patient, unless we can't, uh, there's some reason we can't cross the lesion with it. We're, uh, we're essentially a 100% imaging lab. Wow. Noman, <laughs> obviously no man, you can't can I... do that. For us, it's like another 100,000 rupees to get uh, the IVUS catheter. So 
it becomes very difficult uh, for us to use uh, in patients who are already non-affording and it's not easy. Yeah, that's why I mentioned, you know, for the Pakistani cohort of patients, you, you know, that you want to reserve this for your most complicated patients because the number needed to treat is considerably lower. So if you focus on your high risk patients, that's the best bang for your rupee. So you don't use FFR, IFR, uh, as uh, Rajiv is saying? We do. We, we use it all the time. So we use technology in our catheterization laboratory, and we're not afraid to use both. Um, the reason is we do whatever is the optimal for the patient. And we believe that that attracts more patients to our hospital. So we are the second highest volume interventional cath lab in New York and one of the highest in the country. And we believe the reason for that is that when patients come to us, they know they're getting a precision PCI. And, you know, it's analogous to having a tailor-made suit versus a suit that you buy off the rack. Really, if you have a stent placed in your artery, you really want it to be placed with precision. That's nicely put. So, and Rajiv, in your lab? Sure, you know, in our lab, we you, we're using IVIS and, and, and FFR, IFR, uh, significantly more. We're not using 100% of the time, uh, I'll be honest with you. We were initially around, about yeah, four years ago, about one to 2%. We're number three in the state in volume, so they are better than us. Uh, but we uh, probably now, I personally use it about 20% of the time, either imaging or a physiologic testing. And Gautam- Bashir, uh, can, yeah. sure. Bashir, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Uh, my, uh, excellent presentations. I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Johar that what does he see the future of uh, CT FFR, considering the fact that uh, you can see the anatomy, the functionality, and also the composition of the plot? Do you f uh, think that the future is for CT FFR? You know, I think, you know, I equate this generation of CTFFR to the original iPhone. And I think in five years, when we get the four or five iterations down the, down the road, and we get the, the, the CTFFR 5.0, it's gonna be a lot better and a lot easier. And I think it's going to really uh, allow us to assess patients physiologically, anatomically, and plaque yeah. and architecturally before they come into the cath lab. And that is so important, you know, knowing the calcium, knowing the architecture of the plaque, knowing whether a lesion is physiologically is, is significant, has so much value. And, and, you know, like we use CTA, CT for our structural colleagues with TAVR and, and, and the like, I think CTFFR will play that role in five years with uh, coronaries. So I can yeah, ask I think, uh, question. You can, I think in, in future, CTFFR is uh, perhaps going to take over. Hey, this is Dr. Iman. Can I quickly ask a question uh, to the panel? We have time at the end of the session, if you don't mind. Okay. We're running time schedule. So, uh, Pervez, the stage is yours. You're good to go. Can we have Can you hear me? Yes. Everyone on stage can hear me too? Yes, you can Very good. Assalamualaikum everybody and thank you very much for the honor and privilege for in the invitation and Dr. Bashir Hanif again. I had the privilege of uh, spending this meeting with you back in 2018 and uh, it's a great meeting and you guys do a fantastic job putting it together. So thank you again. So thank I get you. the distinct uh, displeasure of following Dr. Ali and Dr. Jahar. Um, Dr. Ali and I get confused all the time. Uh, you know, we're one of the same person, uh, but not amongst our own people, of course. Uh, but uh, so I'm trying to put it all together here. So I'll take Dr. Ali's talk, I'll take Dr. Jahar's talk, and I'm gonna show you two cases and hopefully that'll help us put it all together. So here's a 63 year old woman with atypical angina and a positive CT angina. So, uh, you know, we, didn't, we did not plan this, I promise, you know, this conversation, uh, but it is absolutely, uh, critical to understand this. So as you can see here, there's a lot of moderate disease. A patient on the CT angio report had shown that 
they had some uh, mild, moderate to severe disease and plaque, soft plaque in, in the RCA. So it was for, for coronary angiography and you can see here. So as you can see here, we had decided to do physiology. And so to take a page out of Dr. Jahar's talk, you know, it's very important to really look at this moderate lesion that was felt that there was a clot <coughs> in, the, in the vessel. That was, a, that was one particular area that was very significant. So we decided to um, put it into an RFR, RFR physiologic assessment. As you can see here, the RFR came back pop significant at 0.81. And then we decided to do an RFR pullback. So you can see here that we did a pullback and, and, geograph and geographically, I don't have the uh, picture for you on the screen. But you could see here that there was a significant step up uh, at one point, and I'll show you where that point was. So then we decided to couple that with some imaging. And you can see here, based on the imaging of where we were, we decided to do OCT in this particular case. You can see here at the markers, as Dr. Ali was mentioning, Using, using the markers and using the, and the imaging, the intravascular imaging to really help define our healthy segment of tissue proximally distally and to be able to land our stent, size our stent, plan our stent appropriately and accurately. As you'll see here, we then opted to uh, place a stent and this is our post stent angiography. You can see here clearly a very good stent uh, apposition, very good stent expansion, uh, good areas, and a successful, very, as, as Ziad said, very precisely placed stent in a very appropriately physiologically assessed lesion. So you can see here clearly, without question, uh, the definition of what we would consider to be very uh, precise, very accurate, very appropriate, and, and Ziad's in words, tailor, tailor made PCI. So, that's a very bread and butter case, a very typical stable case. And this is what, you know, the number needed to treat to probably show that there was an improvement in this particular case is probably quite high. But to take the number, take the next patient, you know, a complex high risk patient, you can see here, I'll show you. Show you this very high risk case, patient who's had prior stenting to the LED, multiple, multiple stents, was actually referred for surgery due to the multivessel disease nature. You can see here uh, an osteal LED distal left main, uh, as well as a very diffuse LED uh, diseased everywhere. However, the person was referred for surgery and surgically was turned down due to a variety of different clinical and anatomical reasons. So the person fell back into our lap. And I'm sure that, you know, having, having done cases with many of you in Pakistan, I have to say that this is not an uncommon patient for you to come across as there as well. So really, what is the guiding principle? For with trip cases, using physiology and imaging is even more important, as Dr. Ali mentioned. You really need to obtain cabbage surgical results if you're gonna perform PCI in these patients. You really have to completely vascularize these patients. And it's really essential to the field of complex PCI for a variety of reasons. You know, we have to really utilize the tools that we have. And, I'm, and I know that as part of your agenda, you have future talks on this in terms of hemodynamic support, atherectomy, lithotripsy, uh, brachytherapy, and drug clothing balloons uh, for in incident restenosis. And it's very important in these patient subsets because these are the patient subsets that actually will probably yield the best outcome. So this particular case, we opted to completely revascularize the patient. As you can see here on the left, we've completely revascularized the LAD. You can see here on the right, you know, we were able, we, we attempted to do a provisional stent strategy and without going too far into the detail of bifurcation stenting, unfortunately, we uh, were able to pinch the osteum of the circ circumflex artery, as you'll see on the right. And so therefore the decision had to be made as to what to do about that pinched circumflex artery. So just to review very quickly, we know that FFR guided versus angio guided PCI and multivascular, in, in, in multivascular uh, disease, you can see here multivessel disease, you can see here clearly if you do an FFR-guided strategy, it's, it's more uh, better, improved outcomes, better mace-free survival. Target vessel failure in the ultimate trial, if you do image-guided PCI, is significantly better than angiographic PCI. So how do we put it all together? So we said, well, we did, we did, we did what we planned to do, but really we didn't like the way the circumflex looked. So let's do an IFR of the circumflex. So we did an IFR of the circumflex, it was 0.82, and therefore we could not leave that circumflex alone. So we went ahead and underwent bifurcation stenting. As you can see here, 
rechecked the IFR at the end of that case and the IFR had normalized. So we successfully appropriately revascularized the patient. And to top it off, we then decided to IVIS every single part of that bifurcation stent strategy to make sure we had optimized the stent as best as possible, sized appropriately, good apposition, good MLA, good resulting result. So in conclusion, really physiology defines a significant ischemic lesion and it's very important to define it. Imaging guides optimal PCI as has been mentioned. And when you put them together, you get the concept of precise and optimal PCI. You get optimal outcomes for your patients. And the, really the goal for us as interventional cardiologists is that we have to give surgical equivalent and or honestly, in so many of the surgical turn down high risk cases, better revascularization options for these patients. So if we're gonna do it, we should do it right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Nicely put it all together for precision PCI. And um, I think we have five minutes for question and answer session. And I believe uh, Wahaj, uh, you had a, a question? Yes, hi. Uh, just wanted to get a, uh, and first of all, so glad to be here and honored to be on a panel with Dr. Uh, Jar, Dr. Ali, and Dr. Miraj. Um, question for all three of you. How often do you guys do post-PCI uh, FFR, and what is the value of that, if any? So as you know, <clears throat> we have um, started the defined GPS multicenter randomized control trial. Um, the largest ever trial to assess post-PCI physiology to determine whether the pullback and the determination of where the lesions are and where you might be missing ischemic lesions has clinical impact. So we're enrolling in that at the moment. Clinically outside of the trial, it's not something we do commonly and that's because uh, in the past, the wires have been difficult to navigate through tortuous anatomy and through stents. That being said, I believe that the Volcano Omni wire is a complete game changer and has the handling characteristics of a workhorse wire with very minimal drift. So it's increasing. I would say in our lab, it's probably about 15% outside of the trial. Any questions from the panelists or the audience? Professor Nadim. Um, I have a question for, uh, um, I think anybody in the panel can answer, but considering Pakistan where, uh, you know, cost effectiveness is a major issue in deciding um, use of imaging or physiology um, during or before PCI. So if we compare, say, I OCT with the IVUS, then where do you, do you think that, uh, you know, where should one bet on? I mean, should all labs preferably just use IVUS or would it be cost effective to have, uh, you know, OCT as well in certain cases? I mean, or I mean, could you get away with having, a, say, a high resolution IVUS most of the times? I would uh, vote for IVUS in that regard, but let's hear from some of the speakers uh, here who gave the talk on IVUS OCT. Uh, Look, in an ideal world, you'd want to have all three. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So I say in an ideal world, if you have an option, you take all three. I think you know if you have to pick one, I personally would pick physiology. Um, so I would pick FFR or IFR. If you could, if you if you had the choice of picking one imaging tool, uh, IVERS versus OCT. I think you could, with all due respect, I think you could flip a coin. I have more experience with IVIS. And so I personally, again, it's a personal preference. I would probably prefer the high resolution uh, IVIS, but uh, I think you could go either way. I, I would, if I had to pick one, I'd get a high definition IVIS. Yeah, just it, with the OCD, sometimes there's limitations with the left main and uh, you know, so if I could say, I'll describe it this way. OCT is like a Ferrari. You can't drive it through the mud. Ivis, you can drive anywhere and you can put your Pocote in the back and not be upset. <laughs> Good one, Nick. I like your great like perspective there. So- um, and I, can, uh, Noman, can I just ask uh, or make a comment about it? Uh, 
I think in, uh, as uh, Professor Nadeem pointed out in a country like Pakistan, where cost is an issue, where would you rate a nuclear scan being done beforehand to evaluate the ischemia before you uh, go in for intervention? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question, sir. I, I... I think his question is to do uh, physiologic imaging before CAT with a nuclear scan. Uh, a lot of the FFR trials were done comparing it with nuclear imaging in terms of the, uh, you know, um, so please go ahead. If, if the nuclear scan correlates with the anatomy of the angiogram, then I think then you're done. Uh, if, you're, if you have lateral ischemia on a, on a nuclear scan and then you see a circumflex lesion that correlates with it anatomically, I think you're done, you, you, you're able to fix. The concern, however, I have is a lot of the times the location is unclear. You may get some inferior ischemia, but you may have a 70% LED lesion. You're not sure what that means, 60% LED lesion. That's when I think your know, appropriateness of stenting, which is like the hot topic in the United States, is where the issue comes up. Can you check the music box? Is it possible that when you have also multiple lesions, there also the nuclear scan becomes difficult to interpret? Definitely, sir. You know, definitely. I mean, you, if you have balanced ischemia, you could have significant three vessel disease and not know it. So. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, nuclear. Look, the nuclear scan is, is a way to get into <coughs> the cath lab. And with all due respect to our nuclear colleagues, uh, there's so much variability in, in the quality of the nuclear scans that uh, I, I hold it suspect. I think in the best of labs also, <laughs> my understanding is its ability to pick up all the lesions is around 60%. I mean, Sensory specificity for picking up any abnormalities around 80 to 90%, but picking up all the lesions, so that's the limitations of that, but I had a question regarding the IFFR and FFR, how much trust you have on your IFR values? Uh, in the lab, I still use both IFR and FFR, and can you elaborate on the binary approach that you use? Uh, uh, if you have a convincing IFR, which is normal range, would you still do um, uh, an FFR? Or so, you know, it, it, to me, it's Bayes' theorem. It, it's your pretest probability. You know, when I do, I always tell my fellows that if you do a test, you better, better be willing to act on the results of the test. You can't just say it's wrong just because you don't like the result. So if I do IFR and if it's in a gray zone, like I mentioned on that case, then I may do FFR, but it, it depends on if I, if I talk, when I talk to the patient, if, if I believe the pretest probability is really high for ischemia, then I, I, I may be more inclined to treat even if I have in a gray zone of 0.89 or 0.90. So I think, you know, medicine and cardiology and interventional cardiology is not binary, it's an art. And I think we have to sort of, without doing things inappropriate, it's an art that we have to sort of look at. And, 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 and the reality is that at times the test results may be inconclusive and we have to sort of look at the whole picture. Thank you. Now we're gonna move on to the next talk, basics of uh, optical coherence tomography. It's, I believe you just have it in one or two centers over here in Pakistan. And Dr. Kautam Kumar <coughs> is going to give the talk. He's associate professor of cardiology at Emory University and an adjunct faculty of biomedical engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Thank you, Dr. Kautam for joining us. Uh, look forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, good morning. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Bashir Hani for uh, kindly inviting me for this. This is a great pleasure. I have uh, missed seeing you and Rajiv and Ziad at all of these uh, national meetings and Pervez, of course. And of course, it gives me the onerous task of following all these giants. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's getting harder and harder. <laughs> um, I have no disclosures relevant to this. So we're going to just talk about a few things with respect to OCT. And, uh, you know, it makes me nervous start sitting here. I'm talking about OCT. That's, that's going to be a tough one as well. Uh, but um, first of all, what is OCT? It was initially developed at Yamagata University in Japan and in the U.S. in 1991. Uh, it was first used for retinal imaging and actually still has a lot of uh, applications at retinal 
vaginal imaging has been adapted for vascular use. Uh, generally uses uh, near infrared light at around a wavelength of about 1300 nanometers or so. So you have a monitor, a computer, a laser source, 50-50 splitter unit that actually tells you the position of where the uh, image is taken from and you get the reflected wave that is uh, imaged. Uh, basically, if you cut an OCT catheter up, you know this is what you will find. You will see a distal marker, a middle marker, which is a lens marker, uh, just proximal to the lens and a proximal marker that's 50 millimeters from the distal marker. Uh, pardon me, from the middle marker. And you then have a monorail lumen, which is generally pretty short, and uh, a purge port, which comes out, uh, which is where the drops of uh, contrast come out when you purge it. So performing an OCT, you know, step by step is pretty simple. You prepare everything, you position the catheter, these are the five piece, you purge it, you puff, and then you do your pullback. So in terms of the preparation, make sure your catheter's there, your console's together, make sure you have contrast, uh, in the hands of certain experts such as Ziad, you know, we've started doing uh, saline OCT as well. And uh, we've been doing, having, uh, we've been playing around with, with some nice results as well uh, in the goal of saving contrast. Position, catheter, distal to lesion or stent, purge. Remember to purge blood from the catheter lumen. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, in general, I like to give a little puff to make sure that there's uh, a adequate clearance or I may need to advance the guide or think about using a guide liner or guidezilla. And finally, pull back, which is the image acquisition. Now, what can OCT do for you? Uh, there's pre and post stent assessment. You can stent the select size, landing zones, planning, position, expansion, apposition. Uh, you can look for intimal tear, dissection, false lumens, tissue we're going to look at examples of all of them. And in terms of PCI follow-up, we can look at strut coverage, new intimal growth, restenosis, and thrombosis. So very quickly, this is an OCT image showing three layers of the vessel wall. Imaging catheter is there. This is the shadow due to the guide wire that you can see. This is a bioresorbable vas vascular scaffold or an absorbed stent. This is what a regular stent looks like, metallic struts bright reflections, and these cast a shadow into the vessel wall. You can see the difference between the two very clearly. Uh, here is an image of a dissection plane. Uh, we happen to be in the true lumen here. The false lumen is actually on the other side, and you can see that here as well. And you can identify what the true lumen structure is. This is an image of red thrombus OCT, high backscatter on the surface, and you basically see not a whole lot behind it, uh, shadow. Uh, this is white thrombus where you have high backscatter, low attenuation, and you're actually still able to see somewhat behind it. This is actually an artifact that you often see, especially when you're doing OCT. This is actually in the catheter lumen, and all you need to do is simply uh, inject a few drops, and you can purge that of blood, uh, which has been done here. Uh, you can see blood swirl artifacts in OCT that is basically due to presence of blood together with contrast in the vessel, as you can see here. Sometimes a side branch may interfere with this. You may have poor guide engagement towards the end of your injection, or you may be using diluted contrast. These are the kind of things you should be thinking about and if you see a lot of blood swirl. Uh, in terms of longitudinal mode, you can measure the lesion length. In cross-sectional mode, you can assess the target lesion versus reference segment. In the old days, when we actually used to measure uh, le uh, the stent slicing ourselves, the image on the left here shows the way to do it. You will understand. If you use this lumen measurement, whereas if you use this uh, stent uh, uh, final result, this is an edge dissection that you can see at the edge of the stent, and you can easily see it on both cross-sectional and longitudinal views. Uh, and this is a small intimal tear, and you can see a very, very small irregularity here. There's a little bit of a thrombus maybe superimposed on that as well. Tissue prolapse can be picked up between uh, the stent struts. Here you have uh, stent malapposition that can be clearly seen. And after high pressure uh, balloon dilatation, you have a better opposed stent. Not totally well opposed, but I would say better opposed. Uh, in stent restenosis, you can see a thick layer between the stent struts and the lumen that you can see in this image. Stent struts are on the outside. Uh, and here you see extensive thrombus as, uh, you know, inside there. Um, and you see some stent struts as well. 
and this is the wire artifact that's produced. Fibrous plaque produces high backscatter, which tends to be bright like this. There is low attenuation. It tends to be homogeneous and finely textured. This is in contrast to calcium that I'm going to show you shortly, where you can see low backscatter, poor signal appears to be darker. Uh, there's lower attenuation. In general, this is demarcated by sharp edges that you can see here. And that generally tells you that's calcium. Uh, there's a number of things you can do with calcium comparing IVAS and OCT and uh, different imaging modalities give you different things in terms of calcium assessment. The nice thing about calcium is you can measure the calcium angle, whether it's greater than 180 or less than 180, maximum calcium thickness, less than or greater than 0.5 and calcium length, five millimeters or less than five millimeters. And these generally tend to predict uh, whether you would need to perform some kind of advanced plaque modification, whether it's atherectomy or shockwave but lithotripsy before you put your stent. It actually does a lot of these things in an automated manner. You can look at expansion, you can look at apposition, you can assess whether there are dissections, that's not automated. And you can look at geographic place stent, you can measure the stent in your view. Uh, these white stent struts tend to indicate optimal stent apposition. Uh, and you can look at precision stent placement next to the side barrel in this case. Uh, finally, uh, I think Ziad alluded to this earlier, there is this MLD max algorithm and refer to pre-PCI and post-PCI and post -PCI that you can look at in terms of strategizing your technique as well as optimizing your technique post-PCI. Uh, I think I will end on time here because OCT is a tool that actually facilitates high resolution imaging of the coronary artery in vivo and appropriate OCT technique is essential in excellent imaging technique and interpretation. And finally, OCT can improve outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, really nice talk. Uh, it's always really nice to look at the OCT pictures with very high resolution, much more clarity than I was um, with some of the limitations that it has. Our next talk uh, is by Dr. Sohail Khan, who is uh, head of uh, Perkinus and Core Interventions Program at Queen Elizabeth uh, Hospital, Brigham, UK. And uh, he's going to talk on intracoronary imaging in spontaneous coronary artery dissection. So, all right. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me. Yes, so, you can hear you. thank you. Uh, Bashir, Nadim, uh, congratulations for getting the meeting up and running. It's uh, always a pleasure to uh, join you, unfortunately, remotely this year. Um, chairpersons, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to just share my slides with you and uh, we can get cracking here. Uh, where are we? Okay, so thank you for the kind introduction. I'm, I'm going to sort of try and uh, piece things together and discuss intracoronary imaging and spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And as mentioned, I work as an interventional cardiologist in uh, Birmingham in the UK. Um, the, the sun is just about to come up here, so <laughs> it's very early in the morning. Um, so what is uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection? Well, this is a, a non-atherosclerotic cause of uh, acute coronary syndrome. And essentially, it's characterized by blood entering and separating the uh, coronary arterial walls to form a false lumen. And this is a, a schematic showing uh, what happens in this uh, uh, particular situation. What you tend to get is axial propagation of uh, blood, uh, which is usually a fibrin rich uh, hematoma, which then causes a compression of your uh, true lumen. Now, if you look at uh, angiograms in patients who presented with acute coronary syndromes, uh, SCAD accounts for anywhere between sort of two and four percent, depending on which uh, registry uh, data you look at. And of course, what we've learned is that there are risk factors for developing uh, SCAD. So uh, female gender by far is the biggest. Uh, Ninety percent of these patients are uh, females. Uh, we know uh, that connective tissue disorders can uh, increase the propensity of developing SCAD, uh, low its deep syndrome. Uh, for example, or uh, Ellis Danlos. And there are newer uh, uh, risk factors which have been identified recently as well, such as heavy lifting and emotional upset. Now, there is this particular entity called uh, uh, pregnancy associated SCAD. Uh, and as I'll show you shortly, this tends to affect the more proximal vessels uh, rather than traditional SCAD, which affects your uh, mid and distal uh, vessels. 
And if you look at the particular cohorts of uh, females who are under the age of 50 who have presented with myocardial infarction, SCAD probably accounts for uh, one in four uh, such uh, cases as the ultimate diagnosis. So angiographic uh, classification in uh, type one uh, shown here on the left, you tend to get a flap with uh, a double lumen. In type two, which is uh, probably the most uh, common uh, type, uh, what you tend to get is a long diffuse uh, smooth stenosis, as I've mentioned, affecting usually the distal vessel. Here you've got reconstitution of your uh, distal vessel as well. Type three is extremely rare. Uh, and one of the reasons might be that actually it just looks like uh, atherosclerotic plaque disease. This is an example of a, a type three, uh, but in the registry data, we see that this probably occurs less than uh, 5% of the time because of its difficulty in, uh, discerning it from atherosclero atherosclerosis. Now we've heard uh, very eloquently this morning already about the advantages and disadvantages of uh, intracoronary imaging, of course, uh, we have just advantages of intracoronary imaging. It, the choice that you have to make uh, when you're considering your uh, intracoronary imaging tool is uh, which one you're going to use and in which scenario. And in the particular circumstance of SCAD, uh, we know that uh, OCT will allow for higher spatial resolution. But one of the downsides is, of course, that you do have to in inject contrast um, at quite a uh, forceful pace, which means that you may well uh, cause propagation of your uh, hematoma. Uh, IVUS uh, has utility because uh, of its higher depth penetration. Uh, and certainly if you're dealing with left main stem or proximal uh, SCADs, then you're probably more likely to reach for your IVUS catheter in that uh, scenario. So here's uh, an interesting case. This is a, a 35 year old uh, female who uh, presented to us uh, just very soon after her uh, fifth pregnancy actually. Uh, and she presented with an acute coronary syndrome. Uh, she had T-wave inversion on her uh, ECG affecting the anterior leads, ongoing chest pain, and she was brought to the cath lab. And what you can appreciate here, the, the right coronary artery looked uh, uh, pristine but you can see that there's restriction in the uh, left main stem um, clearly, and there's uh, what appears to be a lesion in the proximal LAD, and also uh, the circumflex was affected as well. Now in this scenario, knowing her age, what we did here was uh, go immediately with uh, intravascular ultrasound, uh, and you can appreciate here, you can see where the media is, you can see that this hematoma is compressing the lumen of the artery here. Uh, the reason for doing IVUS here was really to exclude the possibility of a type 1 dissection, which probably would have mandated us sending this lady for uh, surgery. Uh, but the IVUS was able to show us that actually this was probably a, a type 2 uh, SCAD uh, rather than a type 1. Of course, these patients never do well with uh, uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. Uh, because what tends to happen is that you get competitive flow as the uh, hematoma reabsorbs itself uh, and the graphs more often than not actually uh, um, occlude. So we were able to treat this lady uh, conservatively. It was a bit nail biting, but actually eventually uh, uh, she was discharged home. You can see uh, when she was brought back uh, subsequently for angiogram follow-up, she's had resolution of her hematoma and her ECG, which was uh, very ischemic looking with T-wave inversion, has also normalized. So she did uh, very well from that perspective. What about a, a, another case? This is a 53-year-old lady who's presented uh, with a short history of chest pain. Uh, she had normal bloods, including uh, troponin, uh, interestingly, and no traditional risk factors for uh, coronary artery disease. And this is what you tend to find in patients in whom you're concerned about a SCAD. As you can see, she's got T-wave inversion in the, uh, affecting the inferior leads. Now, uh, the left coronary artery, I can assure you, was uh, uh, pristine. She, uh, there was no uh, suggestion of any lesions affecting the left main LAD, side branches, uh, circumflex. But what we did find in the right coronary artery was this significant mid right coronary artery lesion. Now, many of you would say, well, actually, what we should do is probably put a wire down here, put a balloon in, put a stent in and send for the next patient. This is a type A uh, lesion. 
But actually knowing her history and you know, the recent Canadian data, which suggests that patients uh, who present with SCAD are usually actually in their 50s, that was their mean age, we went ahead and uh, did OCT evaluation of this uh, right coronary artery. And what you can see on the OCT is that uh, uh, the vessel is uh, very normal looking in the proximal segment, but there is a hematoma, which is causing quite significant uh, compression of the uh, lumen here. And this is uh, the still pictures. And I've marked out here with the arrows where the compressive hematoma is. And in this uh, tighter segment, it's only very, uh, uh, only just allowing our cath to actually uh, uh, enter in. So it's the size of the OCT catheter here. Here it's a bit more uh, better demarcated. You can see this low back scatter. So in fact, what we were dealing here with was a type three SCAD. This is of course, one of the rarer types of uh, SCAD. Now, of course, there are uh, problems with traditional PCI um, if you go and treat these patients, we know that uh, traditional PCI is associated with high risks and rates of complications with low technical success, usually because you end up causing either a dissection or propagation of your hematoma down the vessel. And if, if and when that occurs, you end up having to treat this uh, with multiple long stents, uh, usually involving important side branches and bifurcations. And often because of the problems uh, with the hematoma, you are not really aware of what size the vessel should be. And you often undersize your vessels, which of course leads to high risk of uh, restenosis in these patients. Now, PCI in the recent uh, Canadian registry has been un unsuccessful in about one in three cases. So really, if you can avoid it, you probably ought to. And you know the expert opinion, the consensus now tends to favor conservative management uh, for patients who present with the SCAD, but there are some caveats to that. And those are that if the patient has ongoing ischemia, if they have obviously hemodynamic instability, uh, possibly left main stem SCAD, although that case I shared with you earlier, we were able to treat that patient uh, conservatively and she did uh, very well. So um, uh, this patient actually uh, what we did for this uh, lady was uh, we treated her uh, with a cutting balloon. Now, cutting balloon is not new or novel technology. Uh, it's been around for over 20 years. Essentially, it's a nylon uh, uh, balloon which has uh, these uh, stainless steel uh, um, blades on it. Uh, and traditionally, of course, we've used it, uh, the cutting balloon to treat instant restenosis to avoid balloon slippage or fibrotic lesions. But here, it, the utility in patients with SCAD is that what it does is it basically causes a controlled dissection of your intima. And when you do that, what it does is it creates a communication between the lumen and the intramural hematoma, which then allows the hematoma to uh, drain into the lumen. And if you do this in a controlled manner, uh, you can get some uh, fantastic results uh, with it. So. This is uh, the newer iteration of the cutting balloon, the Wolverine, uh, made by Boston uh, Scientific. Uh, this was a 4 vessel, uh, and we went in with a one-to-one -one sizing here. So we did a, a slow inflation at low pressure, uh, two or three occasions in the proximal RCA. And as you can see on the OCT run following this, uh, we were able to uh, resolve the hematoma, which was uh, present. And for those of you who have uh, very good eyesight, you'll be able to appreciate that actually the blades have made some um, uh, uh, tears within the, and these are controlled tears within the intima of the vessel where we've actually released the hematoma into the lumen. This was the final angiographic result in this uh, lady. Uh, not ideal, not 100%, but I think we will, what we will see is a remodeling of the vessel um, as the flow uh, improves and with time. We did actually publish this as a uh, case report uh, um, in the European Heart Journal of Case uh, Reports uh, back in 2019. And if you want to hear and uh, read more about the specifics of the case and how to perform uh, cutting balloon inflation uh, for SCAD, then I refer you to this uh, article. So uh, just hopefully to keep on time, hopefully I've convinced you that uh, 
um, uh, you know, well, first of all, spontaneous coronary artery dissection uh, is uh, a rare cause of MI. And of course, we all need to be aware of this as uh, interventional cardiologists. Um, intracoronary imaging certainly has a role to play in terms of uh, treatment uh, and de deciding on treatment of uh, such patients. Most of these patients, of course, won't require treatment. And in the absence of uh, ischemic chest pain or hemodynamic instability, you're going to adopt a conservative approach. Uh, in those cases where you're not entirely sure what's going on, intracoronary imaging can certainly help. Uh, particularly if you're concerned about a type 3 SCAD, which can often be mistaken for uh, uh, atherosclerotic plaque disease. And uh, I've shown you here how you can use a cutting balloon as a way of uh, treating such patients uh, um, uh, who have uh, presented uh, particularly with uh, type 3 SCAD. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sujit. It's always a great talk. Uh, you know, uh, showing nicely the intracranial imaging role in the scan and getting the right uh, diagnosis because most of these can be managed conservatively. And interestingly, how uh, Wolverine and cutting balloon can be used uh, in some of these cases uh, occasionally to help uh, resolve the intramural hematoma. Now, I would like uh, the panelists to give their comments and thoughts uh, on this precision PCI uh, in imaging and coronary physiology. Yep. Thank you very much. This is Dr. Asim. Very nice talks. Um, I've got actually two questions for the speakers. <clears throat> the first question is uh, use of coronary physiology where you've got a donor vessel with an intermediate disease cross-filling another vascular territory. So is there a cutoff value which you can clearly rely on and say that this is too representative of, representative, representative of the intermediate disease in the donor vessel? <clears throat> and the second question would be, if you've got a discrepancy between the IFR and FFR values for a lesion, how do you go about that? So any of the speakers, if you could answer that. Thank you. Excellent Thank you. question. Um, I think a uh, few speakers have left because it's very late, 1 a.m. at night over there. Uh, Gautam is uh, sitting there. Either Gautam, if I want to say something, or uh, Swail can say something, please. Sure. I'm uh, happy to take on this issue. In fact, uh, I'm actually pretty interested in this particular topic about a donor vessel to a CTO, uh, a co collaterals to a CTO. Um, so in our experience, we have done a number of these uh, lesions where we have measured the FFR pre and post or IFR or RFR. We've done all of these. Uh, it's interesting that we have actually found that there is no real specific cutoff uh, in the donor vessel that can predict that, oh, you know, this is going to be fine. And that's pretty logical. You know, the, there's a mass of myocardium that's supplied. There's variable viability in that myocardium. There are just way too many variables that you can come up with a specific number that says, oh, yeah, it's going to be always not significant with this number. But I, chances are, you know, if you are at the borderline when you're even starting out, and you have a big territory covered by the CTO, chances are it is probably not going to be significant. But if you have a highly significant FFR in the donor vessel, chances are, you know, even if you fix the CTO, it may still remain significant. So that's the first question. Um, uh, and uh, does, uh, Sohail, do you want to take on the second one? Uh, what was the second one? <laughs> That's about uh, discrepancy between IFR and FFR values for a lesion. How do you go about that? Do you trust oh, you mean the, FFR the, in that situation? Yeah, I mean, I have to say in my practice, you know, outside of the CTO arena, um, I tend to use IFR and only when you are in that difficult sort of gray zone will I then reach for the adenosine um, to help me determine whether or not the lesion is uh, significant or not. Uh, and as we've seen from the data that was presented earlier, about 70% of cases, you know, you'll get a clear cut answer with your uh, IFR. And it's only a small proportion of patients from the defined flare that you're then having to use uh, adenosine to try and uh, get an absolute answer for your patient. So, you know, most of the time I'm for, from a physiology perspective, I'm using IFR uh, just because it's more practical and easier to use. Um, you know, so that's my uh, practice. 
Uh, and maybe if we can touch on one one of the earlier things that was uh, brought up, I think Wahad, you you brought it up actually. You know, how often do people do post procedure IFR or FFR? It, you know, in my practice, if I'm going to uh, intervene on a lesion, I tend to work on the actual wire itself. Um, uh, and if you do that, then that then allows you to just quickly connect back up and uh, determine what your post uh, um, uh, um, PCI readings are as well. So it's a very quick and easy uh, tool. Now, the problem is that actually, if you do that and you get a, a value which is still in the ischemic zone, um, you know, what do you do with that? And, and often we found that actually you can go in with bigger balloons, try and uh, fix the vessel as much as you can, but you still end up in this sort of ischemic zone. And, and then you're left with a situation where you probably uh, angiographically got the best appearance in the vessel, but still are in the ischemic zone on your IFR or FFR readings. And actually there's not very much uh, you can do uh, at that stage, but I find it uh, particularly useful uh, from that perspective. Well, we participated in the Define uh, PCI trial, which is the predecessor of the Define GPS uh, study that uh, ZR referred to. And, you know, in that roughly, you know, to keep numbers simple, about a third of these problems happen proximal to the stent, about a third of these happened at the level of the stent, and about a third of these happened distal to the stent uh, due to distal uh, disease. In, in my practice, you know, before defined PCI, I was doing uh, post-PCI physiology in 0% of patients. After defined PCI, I think I've become a bigger fan, especially since I realized, oh, it's actually not that difficult. And I'm able to work with the FFR wire. It's not that difficult. The contemporary FFR wires are actually a lot more manageable. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I have an affinity for the pressure wire X, uh, which uh, tends to, uh, uh, in my experience, drift a lot less. We are told that the Omni wire also drifts a lot less. But, you know, it's a, a simple question of connecting it, fixing it, uh, and then reconnecting it and uh, checking your FFR, uh, sorry, IFR or RFR post-PCI. I generally don't go to FFR and start administering adenosine again at the end of the procedure. I think uh, uh, the, the, the man, present uh, date, can I, can, can I just make a question? I think uh, Suhail was waiting first, or after that, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Suhail, uh, nice to hear you so early in the morning, and very good morning to you. Suhail Aziz here. Uh, you know, Gotham, you said you worked a lot on critical vessels feeding a blocked artery and, you know, uh, worked on various modalities. Now, the traditional concept is that if you do an FR on a vessel, feeding vessel, which is feeding a blocked artery, it's actually supplying a much larger area. So this FR would be very different from if you opened that CTO and then did that FFR on Absolutely. that critical lesion. So do you think that that is difference is noticed most of the time if the vessel is viable? Yes, I think if it is viable, you are, if the territory supplied by that vessel is viable, the mass of myocardium is much larger and you're more likely to see a bigger difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, uh, actually, what I wanted to uh, ask from our colleagues uh, in Pakistan, for example, Sohail Aziz and Bashir Anib and the others, initially when FFR came into Pakistan, we did a couple of cases, but after that, I have not found many centers doing FFR and relying more on an oculostenotic reflex. Uh, what is the uh, percentage of FFR being done in the different institutes in Pakistan? Yeah, I do few a month, not, more than not because of cost issues, but... Um, yeah, we do, we do quite, quite often. Ten per month, I guess, you can raise the hands to just get a... We, we do quite often, I would say probably around even 30, 35 roughly a month. I think it's not just a question of the academic aspect or a clinical outcome. You find that in our country, uh, there's such a variable approach to these lesions. Um, you know, uh, the modality, the guideline, what happens in USA or England is, is different in that the cost implication doesn't come in. So this guy who let's suppose is from Banu is coming to Peshawar or from Mia Chanu to whatever big center. It's gonna take hours and days of transfer to that place. And 
So you got to make sure that, you know, it's, and they have very limited costs. So um, very few centers can apply this academic exercise and doing the right thing. And uh, you find that a lot of doctor shopping goes around this part of the world. So what one person says, other day is going to differ in the opinion. So with that in mind, people tend to, you know, use FR uh, for more academic reasons rather than the clinical practice. And if you see a critical lesion, let's suppose you see 80% proximality, you find the FR is not significant. Now it becomes real challenge to let this guy go hundreds of miles away, uh, you know. Uh, I think but it's important at that point to stop. If you're doing a test, yeah. even it and follow yeah. it. Otherwise, we are all used to our angiographic. Uh, yeah. So if you do an F, the yeah. FR, there is this, that temptation. The lesion looks significant, but the FR is normal. Yeah. But then believe the mm, test yeah. you perform. Yeah, if you do an FR, you uh, believe it. But the thing is, if you're doing it infrequently, what I see is that people are very hesitant to do it if they have to the lab is because it's just setting the whole system takes time. So what we have done in the lab is to ask them to do drills frequently on a weekly basis and two dedicated nurses who do FFR runs on the wire that has been used to just stay in practice. So when you start it, you can just get into the rhythm and uh, do the FFR. Professor Nadine has uh, been looking for questions. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, my question is to any of the, you know, the esteemed uh, speakers that, you know, in um, a very simplistic view might be that for a chronic coronary artery disease with intermediate uh, sort of lesion, you would uh, do a physiologic study. And for an acute lesion with a similar 50, 60 percent uh, stenosis, you would do a, um, an imaging like an OCT or an um, uh, IVUS. I mean, do you think that the um, improvements in anatomical imaging, they have advanced to the extent that uh, you know physiological image uh, physiological uh, uh, testing may uh, be needed less often or does this uh, sort of age old formula uh, still hold true so both complement each other so, so the speakers answer them uh, is there problem you want to take this or dr suhail uh, yes um so I think you have identified a very, very important difference. And I think, uh, Sohail, you'll probably agree with me as well. In the management of stable coronary CAD and ACS, you know, these are two separate populations. Now, in the ACS population, we are dealing with plaque rupture. And as, uh, you know, my esteemed speakers pointed out before, especially I think Rajiv pointed this out. You know, there is no real big role for physiology in the ACS population, especially when, you know, there is a clear haziness in the coronary artery or there is a thrombus or there is an occluded vessel. Uh, that, that's not the person you want to do physiologic assessment on. Now, on, the, on this side, in the ACS population, you may find that there are some clear cut angiographic uh, lesions where you see the thrombus, you see the plaque rupture, you know that, okay, I need to stent this, I need to open up this vessel, I need to cover this. So that's, uh, you know, so the, in those kind of cases, you know, you may want to do your imaging afterward, or, you know, if, uh, if you know, cost is a significant issue, you may not want to use imaging. The real use for imaging comes in the cases in the middle where, oh, you know, it looks a little hazy, there may be a lesion there, I'm not sure, you know, could this be a culprit lesion? The guy has a troponin of five. You know, should I do an OCT and kind of or study it better? Or should I do an intravascular ultrasound? So I think it's in those kind of questionable areas that this comes in and becomes more of an issue. Uh, what do you think, Sohail? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, those are all very pertinent and important points. The other point I wanted to make, and, and I think uh, what the... Um, question was alluding to is, you know, are there cutoffs from an OCT or possibly IVUS uh, perspective where you can say, well, actually, if the area is below such millimeter squared, your FFR is going to be positive. Uh, people have looked and tried to answer this question. It's actually very population dependent. So we know that, um, you know, for example, the Korean population is going to be very different from your white European population in terms of your cutoff. So they haven't really found a very good uh, cutoff um, in terms of area where you can say for certainty that your FFR will or will not be uh, positive. 
Um, if you're looking at uh, absolute areas, we know that uh, in the left main stem, uh, six millimeters squared is, is probably uh, uh, adequate for a white European population, maybe 4.8 millimeters squared uh, for a, uh, a um, South Asian or possibly um, uh, Southeast uh, Asian population. Um, the areas for LEDs are a bit more complex. Thank you. With this, we'll end our session because we're going over time. My apologies for those who have pending questions. We'll take them on later on. And the next session is on uh, Pelu's case corner. We have some interesting cases lined up, and I would uh, invite uh, uh, Dr. Kashif Asni and General Suhail Aziz uh, to moderate this session. Thank you.